Democracy is not about selfish individual liberty with your gun pointed to someone else's head saying, I have a right to point this gun at you. Yeah. Uh, it's about the notion of, of, of collectively working together to leave things more beautiful than they were given to us. It's a forward thinking responsibility. Yeah. This is what people don't realize. How are you doing, Michael? Doing okay. We're, yeah, yeah. We're, you know, we're, this has been, uh, you know, our fastest, most innovative year. I mean, this has been unbelievable. I mean, our rate of innovation has accelerated. Our functional design has evolved. Our idea of who we are has changed. I mean, all those things. How do you, what do you think about the future of education in general? I mean, this is, this is a pretty fundamental change. Do you think these changes will stay with us? You know, the thing that's always shocked me is that people don't realize that, um, uh, you know, we peaked in K-12 around 1970. So, so, you know, we're still not graduating 20 to 25% and even close to 50% in some communities from high school. We, more than half the kids that have been to college since 1980 have no diploma uh, yet, and debt, uh, you know, costs. And so, right. so the, the model ran its course. And so, so the pandemic, what I'm hoping was enough of a shock, I'm not sure yet, but enough of a shock to get people to realize, you know, there might be some other ways to do things. And so, so I think there are some opportunities for some really fundamental modernization efforts, uh, fundamental cultural change efforts, uh, culture change. I, I just think, I think there's huge, huge opportunity to really take on the, uh, the egalitarian mission of at least public higher, public higher education and public K-12 education in a different way. Uh, we got to start empowering teachers, moving them out of the role of bureaucratic agents and moving into the role of teacher agents, teachers, give the teachers more agency and technology really permits all of that in really significant ways. So, you know, there were so many, um, you know, there's obviously top tier universities. There's the universities that are not quite the top tier. And then all of that other layer of universities are just getting crushed yeah. beneath this, this thing. And I mean, you, you start to see um, universities actually going under, you know, so yeah. how does that redefine um, education? You, know, you talked about the egalitarian nature, you know, the mission that, you know, you yeah. and me, Priscilla, have always shared, but it's like that that's going to be even tougher if people can't yeah. get to school. You know, so what, what happens is that we still are operating the, the education economy on scarcity as the most valued commodity. Uh, and uh, so therefore the line at Bowdoin College and the line at Yale is still pretty long and it's never going to get any shorter because they don't have very many seats and the country keeps growing bigger. Uh, and so that's a perfect model. Uh, you can charge whatever you want. It's kind of like an Italian family named sports car company like Lamborghini or Ferrari or something like that. Uh, but for, for uh, you know, people like uh, Volkswagen, you know, trying to produce a range of, uh, of uh, products using that analogy, you know, uh, uh, we've got to find a way to get people to realize that that those other entities that are uh, based on selectivity, that's not the same thing. Those are different things. Think of those as as, you know, honors colleges or leadership academies or something like that. And then everybody else, the public universities, the public schools, you know, what we really have to be careful of is not to make them something where they're just given away, no investment. Uh, this notion of free, uh, that they have, they have no value in the economy, uh, only those that are selective have value. And so, and so all of that is still spiraling. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can get away from that. One of the projects we're working on is to come up with a whole new classification system. You know, who's taking on what mission and then how are they doing in that mission? So sounds silly, but in our space, it's important. What were some of the, you know, you said you had an incredible year. I mean, yeah. what were some of the, you know, anecdotes, what was happening? What, how did COVID and everything that you're already doing as a leader in the way that you think about education, what were some of the, the, the learnings and what, what's changing? Yeah, well, uh, Priscilla, that's a very broad question. So, so uh, what we could see immediately was the terrible job that we've done at building literacy in our society. So so, you know, we've got people that don't know what ribonucleic acid is or what a messenger RNA virus is. And so, I mean, a vaccine. So, so the messenger RNA vaccines that have been developed are probably technologically more meaningful and more advanced than the Apollo project. They have that scale. They now have given us the ability 
to deal with viruses at the speed of a virus. So let me just put it into perspective. So smallpox in the 20th century killed 500 million people in the 20th century. That kind of thing is not going to happen uh, if, if we have these tools. And so, so that's a huge thing, but nobody gets it. And so I'm, the reason I'm starting with that is that you know, one of the things that I think that we've realized is that what a poor job we've done. So we tripled down, quadrupled down on how do we change teaching, enhance teaching and so forth uh, lessons. Um, you know, one of the lessons is, you know, people don't want to adjust, they want to wait it out. Uh, and we're like, no, you got to you got to adjust immediately. There's no waiting anything out. You're not going to wait out global climate change. Uh, you're not going to wait out the impact of a two degrees Celsius uh, average planetary uh, warming. You're not gonna wait that out, that's already baked in. And so one of the most serious lessons in addition to now realizing how undereducated our population is, how unable uh, uh, to understand scientific issues uh, are for them, is also this notion of, of uh, the solutions are all immediate, and the solutions are all derivative of heroes, as opposed to they, they require collective action. They require collective awareness. Uh, uh, and so those are, that's another lesson. Uh, we also learned that um, uh, uh, our kind of institution, a major research university, is an unbelievable thing. So we didn't have a high-speed, saliva-based, 99% accurate test for COVID in, on February 1st. We did on March 1st because right. we invented it. Right. Uh, and so and so we just went to some of the people down just right over there off my left hand and said, can you guys do this? Yes. What do you need? A few million dollars. No problem. We went out and raised the money. They built the whole thing. We've tested almost a million people. Amazing. We've made te we've made testing ubiquitous to our environment. Uh, we've got uh, uh, the other thing that's been uh, a lesson for me is is. You know, when 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 the challenge comes. If you think of the university as something other than a shopping mall, uh, but you think of it as a thing that can actually respond, it's, the response has been unbelievable. So, we, so we've trained, we've trained thousands of teachers. We've added 40,000 online high school students. We've, we've got hundreds of new projects related to COVID all going on in the middle of COVID, all going on while we're, you know, we've got all of our own stuff happening. And so the lesson for me is the immense adaptability of an institution that's a knowledge creator mm -hmm. when it's not selfish. You know, you understand what I'm saying? So when you, yeah. when, you really, when you really take this on, I mean, it just becomes this powerful tool. In terms of other lessons, I have been, um, and I'll, I'll say this in a way I don't mean to irritate anyone, but I've just been unbelievably disappointed at the teaching profession in general. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we could have done a better job, all of us, figuring out how to be there, to be present. Uh, right. uh, you know, I, maybe I can't have 10 kids in my class, but I can have two. You know, may, maybe I have to sit outside in a park at a picnic table with two kids every, you know, two different kids every day. Uh, but I just didn't see that kind of um, reaction. And so that's been a very serious lesson for me. And that is you know, one of the things that, that we've done is we got ourselves identified as an essential industry, essential service. Mm -hmm. And then I told everybody, we're essential. And that means then, you know, 12,000 of our staff are already vaccinated because we're right. essential. Uh, you know, we're moving forward. We're, we're, we're doing this. We're doing this. We're doing this. And so once you realize that you're essential, you start acting and behaving in different ways. So another lesson is teaching is not viewed even by teachers as essential. Right. And so that, that has to be addressed. So, you know, do you think we're going to look back on this period of time and think that this was some demarcation line? You know, it's maybe not apparent to us now, but just pre pandemic, post pandemic, as, as you know, because it's, it seems like, um, you know, society is just moving faster and faster. It's sort of mutated into new and different directions just every, you know, almost daily you know yeah it, it, it's definitely a demarcation point uh, it, uh you know um what i mean by that is um you know we used to just take our losses i mean it's just you're just dead right <laughs> and so and so people see all the things that we've gone through as if this has been a horrible 
outcome of the pandemic, it's actually been a fantastic outcome in a lot of ways because, you know, we are responding and we're adjusting and we're, and we're doing this and we're doing this and we're deploying technology. So I think what has happened is that our species has just gotten to the point where we realize that we can determine more of our fate than we thought. In fact, there are four things um, that I was just thinking about yesterday. In fact, I, I put this into a couple of things that I've been saying, and I don't have the idea completely thought through yet, but somebody says to me, oh, the sky is falling, the world's coming to an end. I'm like, not hardly. Uh, you know, we are at a moment in human evolution, particularly in the United States, where four things are occurring that at the same time, exactly the same time that have never occurred before. First, we've built pandemic response capability for viruses, which are the scourge of the human species. Viruses are the scourge of the human species, where we can now move at the speed of a virus. We never had anything like that before. We'll have that going forward and it will shape our thinking to be more predictive and adaptive. Let's start predicting these, these, these viruses. Let's start reacting to these viruses. Let's start thinking about how to manage our relationship with the planet in a different way, number one. Number two, We've been 75 years in the United States as the, the science wunderkind of the world, you know, in the sense of, of uh, the NSF, the National Science Foundation, billions and billions of dollars for science and so forth and so on. And now we're about to double down, triple down, quadruple down and launch this thing even more called Science the Endless Frontier again. Uh, and uh, uh, that means then that we're reinvigorating all that thing that we've had since World War II going forward in a way that's just gonna stimulate what I hope is more opportunity for, for uh, everyone. The, the third thing that we've got going on is um, I think perseverance on the surface of Mars, which we have an instrument. We, we built the Z, the, Z, the Z cam, the Z mass, that's our camera out of ASU. That's the 49th mission to Mars. Well, why are we going to Mars? Well, we're not going to Mars to study rocks. We are studying rocks. We're going to Mars to find proof of life. That is why we are going to Mars. That's why we're in that lake bed. That's why that truck is over there, flying it over there tens of millions of miles and lowering it down and it's got a helicopter. The helicopter is not a joy toy. It's not a, a stick, you know, a joystick that you're just driving around. So the second that life off earth is confirmed, the entire idea of abundance versus scarcity is altered. We're no longer trapped on this ball. So we are inches from understanding that everything based in human species experience is based on scarcity. Once we can switch to the notion of abundance, the resources that are available, you know, we're running this mission to this asteroid in a couple of years that we won here to the Psyche asteroid. The value of the asteroid is in hundreds of billions of dollars per person for every person on the earth, meaning you're never going to convert that into money, but it means there's no more scarcity. Once there's no more scarcity, all economics changes. And then the last thing is uh, the Biden infrastructure bill. It's not, it's not only about repair. It's about laying an infrastructure related to digital connection and digital connectivity that truly, for the first time ever, enables equal access to information, equal access to knowledge, equal access ultimately when you get some of these uh, uh, constrainers out of the way to voting, to democratic participation, to all these things. And so these four things, uh, forward-looking infrastructure investment for, for egalitarian access, the notion of moving from scarcity to abundance in the economy, the notion of, of uh, re-enabling for 75 more years, the scientific underpinning of, of the United States, and this notion of messenger ribonucleic acid mRNA virus, uh, vaccines, We've never had anything like this in the history of our of our species as an animal. I mean, we've never had anything like this. It's unbelievable. But but, but Michael, how, how do you you know you're you're talking to people that that want to go along. We we still when you think of education and critical thinking and science and all these things you're talking about, like the Enlightenment again or whatever. Yeah. What do we do with the lots of large groups of people now? We have conspiracy. You know, we have people going down misinformation. Yeah as an educator and yeah. as a really important you know innovator how are we thinking about things like that like misinformation or how yeah. do we what do we do about all that well two two things so one there there, there were human beings have a uh, suspicion built into our biology and so and so I, I just think it's there and so uh 
you can work around it through education so that so so we need to attack it we've got to rethink completely the notion of what's a fact uh, and how you prove that something is a fact or at least the fact the best fact at the moment so we need to work on that we need to completely reconceptualize uh, journalism and i intend to work with our journalism school the cronkite school to be able to work in those directions but at the fundamental root of everything is that we've got to change the idea that education outstanding educational opportunity is only for a few people and only for rich people and if we don't change that i mean right now we've got 50 percent of the people graduating from high school that don't have a high school diploma that's uh, uh, uh more advanced than a 1970 high school diploma you got 20 percent. those are those are the ones graduating you got 20 percent that aren't even graduating so we have to go back in and give up and move out of the way the failed, the failed designs, the cultures built on failure, and we've got to find a way to get every person to a certain level of educational attainment. Here's what needs to be in that 21st century level of attainment, educational attainment. And then every single one of those persons then goes like this. They're then now able to move forward with their life. Now, you guys can say, uh, Priscilla, you can say, or Jesse, you can say, well, that'll never happen. That'll never happen. That's not true. We've made a lot of progress from when we decided that, you know, women couldn't be allowed to read, <laughs> uh, you know, and so, so we've made a lot of progress. And so, and so what we've done is we've like given up on change to some extent. So the way to make this work is there's no way to do this without technology. And now we happen to be at the technological moment where you can, you can personalize learning. Um, even since we've talked, even since I've talked to you guys last, I mean, we're changing everything on how to teach science, how to teach complex subjects, how to teach humanities, uh, how to engage creativity, empower creativity. What we're seeing is that the more that you can individualize this, the more you can free people from bureaucracies that are controlling learning outcomes. And at the root of us being ready for global climate change, at the root of us getting past the, the idiocy of completely contrived, you know, QAnon theories about blah, 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 I mean, um, you know, it, it's, it's all about the foundational level of, of uh, education. Uh, and, 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 and we now have the means, because we didn't have it before, to actually make that change. We just need to do it. You know, do you feel like um, Socrates and Aristotle, Shakespeare, Dante, do they still have a place past this demarcation line in history? Well, you picked a few, Socrates, Aristotle, and uh, you didn't mention their, their buddy, Plato. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, the answer is those individuals are foundational humans that moved us out of the caves and moved us into the realm of intellectual creatures. But they were, and you'll be shocked when I tell you this, they were also highly, highly, highly of the view that humans had, a few humans had great ability, a few humans had some ability, mm -hmm. and most humans had no ability. Right. So they were the elitists that you, right? They were. So. Absolutely. So uh, Plato saw philosopher kings, he saw the guardians, and then he saw the masses. Right. And the universities are still designed on that model. Now it doesn't, it's, and so, the, so those people that you mentioned um, are unbelievable because they were the transformational conceptualizers of an intellectual human. Mm -hmm. And so they can never be forgotten for that. And they need to be studied for that. And then they need to be critically analyzed, critiqued and uh, uh, moved past, in my view. <laughs> so and know, I can so, walk I can walk through anything. You want me to go to Dante? I'll, yeah. I'll go there. You want me to go you want to, to walk past Dante, too? I mean, no, no, no. You don't walk past him. You don't you don't walk. You don't want you don't you don't walk past any of those guys. Yeah. yeah. You, you don't walk past this notion of what it took for us to get from A to B to C mm -hmm. to D. Because you can't understand where we where you can't figure anything out unless you know those things. I think you just crushed Jesse a little bit. <laughs> no, but no, no. I think I know, but I think what's interesting, what you're saying also is this moment of everyone has the voice too. So kind of what you're talking about, which maybe tips into you know identity politics, but what what is that? You know, where what you're saying is it's a democratization, you know, access to knowledge. We all have this right for this critical thinking. And so what does, do we have to look back and really understand as well? We, are, we kind of prioritize our way that we think about 
the great thinkers and the great leaders. Well, no, no. So, let, so let's go back to Athens and let's go back to all of them just for a second, because it's not to be forgotten. It's just the opposite. So, yeah. so before Athenian democracy, you know, uh, there was no such idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and so you, you know, or, or, or before Aristotelian logic and the notion of reductionism and the, and the notion of understanding nature at its finest particle, as opposed to understanding nature as magic, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, that, sure. was, that, that changed the whole trajectory of our species. Yeah. And so now 2,400 years later, we've made a lot of progress and we can't understand that unless we understand them. We can't understand their limits and how far they didn't take us unless we understand them. So I'm not talking about abandoning yeah. any of that, not yeah. one whit of it. No. Uh, and, and, and so then on democracy, you can't understand where we are unless you understand exactly where we started. So you can't see it, but on my desk over there, right behind me is the Athenian city oath. Right. About all of us have the responsibility to leave the city, the democracy more beautiful than it was left to us. Mm. Uh, and, and, and that is a transformational moment in our species history. And unless you understand how they got there and what they did to do that and what mm -hmm. that meant, you can never understand, you can never understand what a democracy is, which is a democracy is not about, uh, not to belabor this, but it's not about selfish individual liberty with your gun pointed to someone else's head saying, I have a right to point this gun at you. Yeah. Uh, it's about the notion of, 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 of collectively working together to leave things more beautiful than they were given to us. It's a forward thinking responsibility. Yeah. This is what people don't realize. Now, what do you think will happen when, if we find in that sand, in that riverbed up on Mars, if we found life, yeah. you know, or, or traces of life, you know, how does that affect our species? Well, I mean, it, it will, it will be, it will be something that probably, a lot of humans uh, already know intuitively, uh, you know, how, how can life be constrained when this planet has been bombarded with meteors and, and uh, uh, comets and all kinds of other things. And when we are all born out of the same stuff, back to star stuff like Carl Sagan used to talk about. Uh, and, and, so, and so what I think will happen is that it will accelerate the movement from us being basically an isolated village. So the planet don't, it is no longer a constrained, isolated village. It's now a, a, uh, an emergent species in a complex flow of, of space, time, and biology, which now is, is got biology in it. Uh, and the notion of life being fixed on one place, I think it will, it will change to the earlier comment that I made. It will change our logic from scarcity to abundance. So once we realize that there is no limit to what we need and we don't have to wreck this planet, you know, we can, we, you know, there, 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 there may be places we can grow things somewhere else. There may be things we can mine things somewhere else. There may be billions or trillions of asteroids or objects that have all the minerals that we need. We can stop mining the earth. Uh, you know, we can do this and this and this. I just think that it will be this huge opportunity where we'll shift. So we're a, we're a worried species. We're a where's the next meal going to come from and who's going to come in my door and kill me. And so and so our existence, our evolution on this planet has been so hard, so rough. So, I mean, billions and billions of human beings have been died in disease and died in warfare and died in everything that you can possibly imagine. Once we realize that we're no longer constrained, I think everything's altered from that point going forward. It won't you know, be in one day, but it will, it will be the beginning of that process. Um, we see some of these projections on what these asteroids are worth. And, yeah. you know, you start to see financial models where people want to go and explore these, these, um, these asteroids and bring back gold and precious metals and all these, these things. You know, what do you think that does? What is the future of work when there is, when we get to, say, a, a period of an ab abundance where by, you know, we don't all have to go out and work. What would our highest ideal be then? Yeah, you know, how so, would life so, change, you know? Well, it's not, it's not just that. So the asteroids, by the way, can also be hollowed out and can be used as uh, farming facilities that are, you know, five kilometers across and 20 kilometers long. And so the thing that people don't realize is, you know, uh, what was the work of Aristotle or Socrates or Plato? Thinking, creativity, you know, uh, what, you know how many, how many um, uh, da Vinci's, 
uh, might there have been rather than have been one, maybe there could have been 30. And what, what could 30 da Vinci's have done? Uh, and so all of these people that have uh, uh, not been empowered to a full level of creativity. You know, we think that we're at like the maximum creativity of the human species. Are you kidding me? We're like five inches out of the caves. You know, you know, we're still burning uh, dead animals and dead plants as fossil fuels, lighting them on fire, boiling water, producing electricity and ruining the atmosphere. Uh, you know, imagine that we had completely different ways of thinking about all kinds of things. And so, so I, it's going to be a rough transition because we're still fixated that, that there's two types of work, physical work and thinking work. Uh, and, and we don't realize that there's, there's all kinds of things that we could be doing and all kinds of things that could be happening if we could be doing those things. And also, it is the case, and you know this, you probably feel it, we work too much. You know, we have, you know, maybe it would be better to spend more time, you know, uh, walking, talking, painting, raising your children, uh, you know, enjoying this unbelievable place that we live. I even say this to myself. Uh, and, and so maybe we could work less and achieve thousands of times more with less life destroying work for human bodies. Right. You know, quantum computing, uh, you know, FinTech, all these different new, new technologies on the edge. How important are they for the future of, of humankind? Well, what's happening as we, you know, there's 8 billion of us now that'll probably peak off here in uh, a few decades and then begin Although to go we we, we keep hearing that. And then it's let your world health organization says it's 9 billion now, you know? So yeah. Yeah. No, and, and so, but yeah. And so, well, so that the, uh, you know, in, in Isaac Asimov's um, foundation trilogy, you know, there are trillions of humans across many star systems in the galaxy. And then mm -hmm. uh, in, and in, in his later piece or his earlier piece, actually, you know, where he's, he's looking at, you know, the, 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 the final question, you know, he sees us ultimately then, creating the entire universe by uh, artificial intelligence engagement. And so what's happening with these things is that all of these technologies, all of these tools will enable us to grow from this poor, we're a poor planet. This is a poor place. There's no reason for it to be poor. There's no reason where every single human on this planet can't have what it takes to have a, a beautiful life. I mean, there's no reason whatsoever. There's no lack of molecules to do that. There's no lack of means or, or chemistry, or physicality, or water, or whatever. There's no lack of any of that. All there is is this rigid, structured thing by which we think work is the function of hours, and, and, and this, and this, and this. And so all these tools and all these technologies should allow us to drive the economy forward, but we have to figure out how the bottom two-thirds of the economy in terms of incomes are not completely abandoned and put into a, what was that movie, uh, Elysium, you know, where all the rich people lived in this space station yeah. and then everybody else on Earth just was just workers. And so that's the path that we're too much on right now. But there's no reason that we can't change that. We can change that, particularly if we upgrade uh, educational attainment. You know, climate, you know, we're two degrees off, but maybe more. You know, what can we do now, you know, just to nip this in the bud where we are? Well, I mean, I, I'm of the view that we we're close to or just slightly past the tipping point where the the upcoming generations aren't going to put up with this anymore. They're not going to put up with destruction of the living systems on which we're dependent. And they've they've been uh, at least in the uh, uh, industrialized world, they've been better educated. And so thus, you know, you have all these forward all these companies saying, well, we're only going to produce electric cars. We're only going to do this. We're only going to do that. So what we have to do is. Um, you know, we basically have to uh, uh, adapt to the already baked in probably two degrees C change and all the things that that means, and then use that to learn our lesson and to generate wealth from that while we back off all these driving forces that drive up that, that uh, global warming inputs that then drive up global climate changes. Uh, we have to defeat vehemently uh, those that selfishly for their own economic interests are perpetrating lies and falsehoods about about this but most importantly what we have to realize and this is really hard and you, i may disappoint you again as priscilla said jesse <laughs> no, sure, uh, sure. you know the the last twelve thousand or so years of our species history has been the calmest time in the planet's uh, climate history in a mm -hmm. long time and so this is a rough place 
you know, as you know, New York City was buried by a thousand feet of ice within the last 20,000 years, a thousand feet of ice. Uh, the ice went all the way to St. Louis. Uh, I mean, that, that was just through normal stuff. We had nothing to do with that. So we are not adaptive enough. We, we don't understand what it's going to take to actually be completely adaptive to the complexities of the planet. And so we're, we're way off right now. We're going to suffer a lot unless we figure this out. It's going to be very, very expensive. And we've got to get into the business of adaptation is who we are, you know, what, you know, where we are, what we build from, what we do, how we, you know, the economy has got to be an, an economy of adaptation rather than an economy of use, 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 destroy, destroy, destroy. Now you have politicians, you have business, and you have institutions of higher learning and, and probably a lot of others. How do we create cooperation amongst those kinds of groups when they all see the world slightly differently? We have to come to a way where we, where we share uh, goals. And so, uh, so I, I live in a, a part of the country that's really purple. Uh, and there's a lot of red paint put into that uh, mixture to get that purple. And there's a lot of blue paint in there to get that all mixing up. And I've got to talk to red, blue, and purple. So I'm dealing with everybody. And so when I'm talking to business leaders who uh, are often uh, reddish or, pur or, or purple, uh, I say to them, well, I guess you don't want to be in business anymore if you can't get nighttime heat index in Phoenix under control, because if we don't get nighttime heat, nighttime heat index under control, the ecosystem that supports all of these beautiful plants here in Phoenix is gone because the bees will be dead. All the insects will be dead. Everything will be dead. No one will want to live here. And at some point, the big banks in New York and uh, elsewhere are going to say, well, we're not going to lend you people any more money. What do you mean? They say, well, we're not going to lend you any more money because there's, there's not going to be any return on any of our investments. We're, and so, so we've gotten from, a, from an all Republican County Board of Supervisors investments in reducing nighttime heat index, investments in understanding resiliency, investments in understanding local uh, atmospheric management. Uh, uh, and, and, and so what we haven't done, and I've thought this from 50 years ago when I was a an undergraduate environmental science major, uh, you know, I, I, uh, that, that we made everything disconnected when we did the science. Right. And so, and so what we need is we need a commonality of language that goes from, well, what does this mean? So if somebody says that, you know, two degrees Celsius increase in planetary atmosphere, just don't tell me that it means doom and gloom and more storms and more damage. No, what does it mean economically? What does it mean from an agricultural productivity perspective? So, 25 years ago, I was uh, one of the lead arch architects on building a thing called the International, uh, International Institute for Climate and Society, International Research Institute for Climate and Society, the IRI, which was, how do you make forecasts about climate that aren't just related to the weather? So we made forecasts based on fishing, fishing outcomes, agricultural outcomes, uh, salmon flow, salmon upstream, you know, all these kinds of things. And so what we've never done is we've never equated science to what it means for a regular person. And so, and so that's what we have to focus on. You know, is that a function of storytelling? And is that something that the Cronkite School can focus on? It is a function of storytelling. Uh, you know, so the, so the Attenborough Blue Planet stuff, though, is, is uh, uh, not that, though. So that's emotional, uh, has a lot of impact on a lot of people, but it doesn't offer any solutions. It just only offers the, the problem. And so, so, you know, so what is the solution? Well, if we did this in this way, you'd get this economic outcome. And then you'd, you'd lower uh, temp, uh, you know, global warming if you did that. And so what people are doing is that, is that we're, still, we're still operating under, uh, uh, you know, non-educate, non-transferable models, non-translatable models. What we need is translation between and among all these forces. I have a question, you know, in that kind of what you were just out articulating a moment ago around purple and political yeah. activity, where is government, does government have to be adaptive? Like what is, is do we need to rethink what is governance? We, we, ha we, have, we have a huge problem in government because we're running government now. Uh, many people uh, in the progressive uh, camps believe that government is the solution. Uh, and, and therefore, the only way government can be funded is through taxes. And the only way that government can operate is through uh, regulation. 
Uh, and uh, it may be that there's vast amounts of the things that we want to do that that's not the best path for. But that doesn't mean that we can't attain all of those objectives. And so, so government is still basically, um, oh, I don't know, uh, 13th, 14th, 15th century Ottoman bureaucratic models, Chinese bureaucratic models. We, we, we have heavily adapted the British models uh, of, the, of the, just right at the time of the revolution, King George II, those bureaucratic models. Our, our, bureaucrat our bureaucratic departments and agencies are archaic in their structure. Uh, and and uh, they are, uh, uh, even the models of public servants. So public servant means, okay, well, I need, I need the smartest vaccine specialist in the world, and I'm gonna pay that person a tenth of what they can make working for uh, for a company, and that's it's still in our model of what the government should be, uh, uh, and, and and so we have archaic models of hiring, archaic models of paying, structuring, holding accountable, all these things. And so we need to go back and just do a reset uh, and and come out with some better designs. You know, is there an opportunity in the infrastructure bill to to push our society forward? I mean, is that what is the opportunity there? It looks like you know, building roads and bridges yeah. and. Well, there, 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 there is, if you do one thing. So here, here's an interesting thing. So, so if the infrastructure bill is uh, ultra modern, uh, let's take this. So if, if you built more autonomous capability in cars to assist drivers while driving on freeways in urban areas, you could in California, and this math has been run, never have to build another freeway. Right because the efficiency of the freeways would be so accelerated that everything would move, travel times would be greatly reduced just by autonomous vehicles. That would mean then that you would have enough money to make every freeway perfect, that is constantly repaired, constantly renewed. Right. And, and, so, and so if we look at the infrastructure bill in a way where we're modernizing all aspects of what we're doing, you know, intelligent highways, intelligent tra transportation systems, intelligent cities, uh, all these kinds of things, the jobs that run all of that go upskill. The uh, efficiency for everyone that's a worker uh, becomes more dramatic and you get infinitely better outcomes. And so you wake up in the morning and you're living in, I don't know, you're living in Riverside and your job is in San Bernardino and you're in the Inland Empire in Metro Los Angeles. And it's one of the most polluted places in North America. And it says, oh, well, Jesse, you know, we've got you scheduled to go in on Route 6 at 1030 uh, to manage the atmosphere for the next you know, two or three days. And then all of a sudden the sky is cleaner and the air is cleaner and your kids going to school and you can, you can work remotely before that. I mean, I'm just telling you that if we look at all this stuff and every element in the infrastructure bill, the elements for uh, internet connectivity, the elements for smart highways, the elements for advanced uh, technology, they're all in there. They're not as explicit as they should be. Uh, but uh, it's really an opportunity for us to try to get this right, because now we have the means with computational assets to be able to do all of this. Um, you know, you, you've collected such smart people at ASU. Was that difficult to do? How do you, what's the secret to your recruiting? The principal secret to, the re, to our recruiting is, would you like your life to make a big difference for a large number of people across a transformational university that's working on an egalitarian set of goals and objectives? And a lot of people say, yeah, I'd like to be a part of that. Can I still do my chemistry? Can I still do my art? Can I still, can I still teach, uh, uh, you know, lyrical opera? You can come here and teach lyrical opera and your kids in your classes will also be double majoring in, in engineering and English and, and the future of innovations in society. And so people say, you've created that? And we're like, yeah. And so, and so then people want to be here. Absolutely. And, and was it difficult to construct that? Uh, everything is difficult, <laughs> but it's so different than a normal university, and it and it competes with any of them on every level. So yeah. it's like, what was the what? I mean, you get great students, you get great faculty. It's like, you know, how did you do all that? The 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 key was to first focus on the purpose of the institution, so that we weren't. Uh, I lived in New York City for eleven or twelve years, and so I remember like the schools were named by numbers, and I'm like, well, that's weird. There's no identity to a school that has a number. I go to, I go to, you know, public school 18. Oh, wow. Right. Public school 18. And so, and so what I was trying to move past this notion of generic state university, 
So that, you know, so they were all just generic. Well, you don't want anything generic. You want to have identity. You want to have intellectual meaning, intellectual purpose. You want to have your own path, set your own path. And so if I've done anything here at ASU, it has freed us to actually become a living, breathing, thinking, deciding, designing place. We are plotting our course. We're not public school 18. <laughs> and, 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 so, and so that has been uh, empowering. That has, that has moved people out of being constrained all the way down to the design of degree programs and the design of classes and the use of technology. And in fact, you don't even know this yet, but the, the most significant projects we've ever worked on that are going to change the way people learn are being worked on since the pandemic started. Wow! Uh, uh, in our in our partnership with uh, Dreamscape Immersive uh, mm -hmm. over in Los Angeles. So sure. sure. Um, uh, and that work is to have people learn in an in an immersive environment. Yeah. That that work is to allow a person to a student to. Uh, excite their imagination while they're learning the history of the evolution of a cell. Now, for 10% of the learners, that happens when you teach them the history of the evolution of the cell. And for 90%, it's like, why do I have to know this? Uh, and for 50%, it's like, I don't even want to know this. Right. <laughs> and, so, and so what we've tried to do is, is take foundational concepts. In this case, biology is where we're starting. So you're a kid. You uh, get into a uh, virtual reality goggles and you find yourself in a pod. You're transported by transporter beam to an alien zoo 20 light years away. The alien zoo is filled with uh, thousands of species from all over the galaxy. And now you're a scientist in your pod with other students using all these tools as in, in your system to right. learn biology. This is a one year biology class, six credits. Yeah. And when you're done, we believe everyone will have mastered the fundamentals of biology. Now imagine if everyone in our society had mastered the fundamentals of biology, we probably wouldn't have people saying, I'm not going to wear it. I don't know where my masks are, but right. I'm not going to wear that mask because that thing can't get me. I mean, right. are you kidding me? If you knew fundamental biology, you would have your mask on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> to me, Michael, what I hear from you and, and we've heard from you, I mean, in the end, it's really also about having fun. I mean, there's joy. I mean, the way that you're, just the way that you're talking about that, I want to go take that and yeah. I want to go take that. I want to go back and do it all again in the way that you're talking yeah. about. So there's something really fundamental about igniting the imagination, creativity, and you have this boundless optimism. Where does it come from? Well, so the optimism comes from, it comes from a, a really simple thing. Uh, it, 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 it comes from this notion that that each and every individual that's called a human is given this thing, this brain. The brain is you know, 80, 85 billion neurons, thousands and thousands of synapses. It's the most complicated object in the known universe. Why do we have that? Why were we given that? And I don't, I don't believe that we were given that brain to carry water in a sack. Uh, you know, uh, and so, which a lot of us have had to do through the eons of time. Uh, uh, or to die at age five from an unmanaged virus. I just don't think, I, you know, and, and so, so for me, and this is a long story to this, but for me, the story was observing as I was growing up the unbelievable potential of science and technology and then seeing its very uneven deployment. Yeah. And then, and then looking at those two things together and saying, well, that just doesn't, that just doesn't have to be the case. And then, and it's not, when I say science and technology, I mean, social science, I mean, behavioral science, I mean, I mean, all those things. And then, and then underpin, underpinning all of that is our expression of our identity through art and, and uh, uh, literature and all the other things that, that are a, a, a uniquely human uh, creative outcome. So the optimism comes from, there is no way that our species given this brain, given these opposable digits, given the ability that we now have to work on any dimension. I mean, we've got researchers here at ASU that are dissolving uh, 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 chemical crystals called photosim one to understand how photosynthesis occurs at the root base level so that we can replicate photosynthetic systems that we're designing. Right. Uh, we've got people that are studying uh, uh, messenger ribonucleic acid systems that can then be put into your body to then make certain that those 50 virally activated cancers have no place to land in your body. Right. 
we never, humans had never had anything like this before. So the optimism comes from this unbelievable progress. And so Jesse, just to be clear, so without Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and you know uh, thousands of others of that yeah. era and and uh, the 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 uh, Cicero and the Romans and the emergence of all of uh, of philosophy and the and the the Asian and Arabic and European philosophers without that we would have never gotten to where we've gotten since the Enlightenment began and then and then you know, if, if, if I look at it, I mean, so I'm hopeful that we're in the first four or 500 years of a, of a, of a 10,000 year enlightenment. Uh, and in that 10,000 year enlightenment, which is nothing in our history, nothing. And so in our 10,000 year enlightenment, we actually took on all these things that produce these negative outcomes for humans. And there's nothing, there's not a single thing. Like I said, every molecule we need exists right here. And every processor that we need exists right here. And that means there is actually no limit. And I can sort of work the math out for you on that. And that means then that it's all about driving this potential forward. Um, thank you. Priscilla thank you saying, very much. where do people like that guy come from? <laughs> no, we need, no, I'm thinking we need more of that. Yeah, thing. exactly. That's what I'm thinking. Well, how are yeah. you guys doing? How's we're everything doing going? Good. Everything's going good. We're, we're grateful. We, yeah, we're, we've been able to keep going and working and, and learning a lot as well. But um, yeah, we're here and we continue to uh, try to tell stories also and yeah. to incredible people like you. So yeah, yeah well, we've got, well, we're, we're, you know, we're graduating 17,000 people That's in the first amazing. week of May. We've got uh, maximum enrollment, uh, but I think more than anything has been to watch. I, 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 I teach, I, I ask all the senior officers at the university, if you're on the faculty to teach, so I happen to be teaching this semester. So I've got hmm. 18 kids or so, and I go to class and three or four, we let three or four of them into the smaller spaces. So we're teaching and the rest come in by zoom. Hmm. So we've got, and then they rotate in. And so I'm able to see everybody, you know, over the weeks and so forth. But what is amazing to me is to see their way that they think. So whether they're engineering majors or yeah. chemistry majors or policy majors or law school majors, without a doubt, every single one of them is focused on social justice enhancement, yeah. without a doubt. I mean, it's coming up in everything. And so what, what I see here is a fundamental shift. Now these are painfully activated shifts, as we know, over the last year, but nonetheless, yeah. these are shifts. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to see these kids and to see what they're doing and see where they're going and all of that. So it's just been very inspiring to me also. Well, thank you, Michael, very much. All right. Nice Good to see you to guys. See you as always. Thank you.